One day and one night later, I arrived in Berlin. Emerging from the Anhalter station, I was stopped in my tracks by the destruction. Broken glass, mortar and rubble were strewn everywhere. And for the first time, Marianne was not at the station. Intending to call on Marianne at her office, I boarded a streetcar bound for the centre of the capital. That ride was appalling. Large sections of the city had almost been levelled by the saturation bombings, leaving rubble, dust and a million tragedies. I felt as if the bottom were falling out of my world. I felt like running away and leaving the city on the next train. But I eventually reached the spot where Marianne had worked, that is, where her seven-storey office building had once stood. Only a few walls had remained. Bricks were piled up two storeys high. I turned away from the devastation, searched for and found the nearest subway stop, then took the express train to the suburb where Marianne lived with her parents. Leaving the station on foot, I saw here and there a home burned to the ground, an apartment house collapsed. It seemed that death and destruction were following me. As I neared Marianne's home, I braced myself against a reality I already sensed. Then I was standing before the heap of charcoal that had been the house. Its chimney poked into the air like a warning finger. Around it lay smashed bricks and blocks, black with soot, steel beams bent in the heat of the fire, jumbled debris of all sorts. Then I saw the signs stuck in the rubble. Somebody had written in red, All members of the Hardenberg family are dead. I read it two or three times before I turned away. I was unable to comprehend. Something acrid burned in my throat. I swallowed repeatedly. Then my heart suddenly hardened. At that moment all in me was dead burned out like the homes. I was without emotion. The next express carried me back home to Frankfurt. With Marianne's death preying on my mind, I spent four aimless days in Frankfurt. I also spent one night in the cellar of our apartment house, listening to the screaming sirens and the bellowing of the flak, shaking to the tremors of the exploding bombs, and looking into the serious, stony faces of people who accepted the raid as a routine event. When it was all over, the night was filled with the caustic stench of cordite, the moans of the wounded, and the bells of the fire brigades. This was what the war had come to, that my Marianne was an air raid victim that my family had grown accustomed to living underground in fear of their lives. After that night, there was nothing left for me at home. I had to return to my boat and fight the war at sea to a successful end for the sake of those who remained at home in anguish and dread. After a night on a darkened train, I arrived in Paris. The city breathed peace and the hot June sun gilded the trees and rooftops. The heat made my uniform uncomfortable and set me to thinking about the advantages of civilian clothes, how I would enjoy pretending to be a part of the sophisticated Parisian crowd, which did not care about the war one way or the other. There I noticed that the most elegant Parisiennes paid no attention whatsoever to men in uniform. I realised how far I was from their lives of splendour, beauty and charm. How deep was the gulf between the peaceful crowds in the city and us on the front, who had no choice but to sail and fight and die. I arrived in the compound in Brest late in the evening and found Riedel and my other friends in high spirits in the flotilla's bar. I joined their merry party and we made the bar tremble with our rough exuberance and echo with our ribald sea chantes. This was what we all needed to help us forget that our number would soon be called, that we all had but a short reprieve to sing and drink. This was what I needed to counteract the twin shocks of Marianne's death and father's trouble with the Gestapo. I needed my friends, strong drinks and the excitement of the wanton life to bring me sweet forgetfulness. I also needed duty and hard work. In the days that followed, I had all these and more in abundant supply. I quickly adjusted to the old routine, made my daily trips to the shipyard, took a firm hold of the crew, only one man caused me any real difficulty. That one, a seaman, used to jump the wall at night to join the fun in town. He had the bad luck to get himself involved in frequent fistfights, usually over girls, and I decided to send him away for eight days into solitary, that is. Otherwise, he was an excellent man and reliable as soon as our boat left port. During my short absence, there had been a remarkable addition to the flotilla's staff. The importance of the flotilla's place in the navy had been discovered, 
and with it the need for a staff photographer to record interesting events for posterity. The photographer turned out to be an attractive young woman. Her casual good morning prompted me to issue an invitation to a drink. As soon as we sat down at the bar, I said, You have a very familiar southern accent. Yours is not exactly Berlinish either, she retorted with a smile. I admit that. I grew up on Lake Constance on the North Shore. What a coincidence, she said. I lived across the lake in Constance. I am Veronica. Everybody calls me Vera. I invited Vera for dinner and she accepted without thinking it over. After my day's work was done, I took a swim in the pool, which was another new addition to the compound. Then it was time for our rendezvous. I knocked at the door of the bungalow Vera had received in lieu of an apartment. We left the compound and strolled through the narrow streets of Brest in the fading afternoon sun. For dinner, we had snails broiled in butter and herbs, shrimps and tartar sauce, a large lobster and a bottle of Beaujolais. Then we went to a small secluded cafe and we danced to the music of a piano player, who obliged us with all the tunes we requested. Soon we returned to the compound, and it was a strange experience to be admitted to the flotilla's closely guarded quarters with a female. From that night on, I met Vera regularly after work. The evenings were ours. One Saturday I recalled my vow to buy a civilian suit and invited Vera to join me in a search for material and a tailor. Despite the depletions of the long war, one tailor offered an amazing variety of fabrics without ration tickets. I chose a plaid fabric, had my measurements taken, a price fixed, and a date set for delivery of the finished suit. I was not the least disturbed that I might never have an opportunity to wear it. With this purchase, I somehow forced myself to be optimistic. In those few remaining days in port, there was plenty of reason for pessimism. When a friend failed to return from patrol, when the truth about our losses in May was confirmed, when a boat crawled into harbour severely beaten, when reports of mounting losses circulated through the mess halls, then the memory of our watery hell came back to my mind, and a presentiment of disaster rose like a wall between the two lives I led. The worst of it was that our boys were unable to sell their lives dearly. For all of our casualties, we had sunk in April only one-third as many ships we sent down in March, and only 50 enemy vessels, totalling a mere 265,000 tonnes, had been sunk in the disastrous month of May. As of mid-June, the U-boat war had come to a virtual standstill. Sixteen more boats had been lost in a fortnight, and Admiral Dönitz had called for a temporary halt in our attacks on the shipping lanes of the North Atlantic. The surviving boats were redeployed but not withdrawn from the front. On the contrary, to offset our stunning losses, great efforts were made to refloat boats in dry dock and to finish those under construction in shipyards. The idea was that every boat we had, even the unsound and outmoded ones, should be put into action to show the Allies that our back had not been broken. Dönitz, in a speech he made in Lorient, assured us that our battle reverses were only temporary, that the tide would be turned by our countermeasures, but that in the meantime we would have to go on sailing. Our efforts, he said, would tie up Allied naval forces in the Atlantic and keep Allied bombers away from our cities. At the end of June, I took U-230 out of dry dock and brought her to the pier, where her fitting out was to be completed. With that one decisive movement, all our adventures in port came to an end. All that was real was the boat, the war, and the inevitable clash with the enemy. These were the facts. Everything else was merely a wishful dream. In the afternoon of June 29th, after the captain had returned from a briefing at Senior Officer's U-Boat's West Headquarters, he asked me to see him in his room. Siegmann added, Bring Friedrich and Riedel with you. I have some interesting news. Twenty minutes later, we were there. The captain said, Have a seat, gentlemen. It will take a while for what I have to say. And what you are going to hear must not leave this room. Headquarters has selected us for a special mission. The prime objective of our next patrol will be the laying of mines. The target is the east coast of the United States. We will take aboard 24 magnetic mines of latest design and plant them in Chesapeake Bay more precisely, in front of the US naval base at Norfolk. I do not have to point out the dangers of this undertaking. 
and I insist that our destination remain a secret until we are at sea. I would not like to arrive in the United States to find a reception committee waiting. One thing more. The waters of the Chesapeake Bay are too shallow to permit a submerged operation, so we will have to execute our mission on surface. I ask you, exec, to secure all necessary charts of that area and keep them under lock and key. The three of us had listened intently and greeted the plan as a welcome departure from a routine patrol. Concerned about our defence, I asked the captain, If we have to store 24 mines, that doesn't allow us to take more than two torpedoes. Two is correct, exec. The rest of the space will be taken up by the mines, for which you will be responsible. Friedrich asked, How much fuel are we going to take aboard? Just the regular amount. Everything is well organised. We will be supplied by one of our large U-tankers somewhere near the West Indies, our future area of operation. There we will receive plenty of food, fuel and torpedoes. You, Riedel, will have the crew fitted out with tropical gear and arrange for that special diet for the tropics. And Siegmund concluded, Gentlemen, I expect to stay at sea for the remainder of the summer. On July 1st, we took over the mines. The strange supply of elongated capsules stirred immediate speculation among the boat's company. Some of the men were positive we would mine an English port. Others thought that the place would be Gibraltar Harbour. The smart ones, however, believed we would travel as far as the important West African port of Freetown. I smiled at the heated discussions, and was glad to see that the crew was as eager as ever to go to sea. But the closer we came to the date of our seagoing, the more sceptical I became about any imminent betterment of our situation in the Atlantic. None of the anticipated improvements had been installed aboard U-230. The METOX, our radar detection gear, was still said to be the ultimate in radar warning devices. Additional anti-aircraft guns had been promised, but had not arrived in port in sufficient numbers. Rumours about new inventions such as a rubber coating around the hull and superstructure to reduce radar and ASDIC detection, proved to be just that mess hall rumours. The only real improvement was the installation of armoured plating around the bridge in lieu of our rigid radar, which was as obsolete as the 8.8 centimetres, cannon on foredeck that had also been dismantled. As things stood, all the odds were against us. The British were throwing in planes in such huge numbers that scarcely a U-boat could traverse the Bay of Biscay undetected. Within a six-week period, the Allies had reduced our active U-boat force by 40%, and many of the survivors had yet to break through the blockade and reach port safely. Notwithstanding the terrible attrition in our ranks, we still believed that we would reverse the tide if we held out long enough. We had to hold out. Two days before sailing, I went to see my tailor again. He had not completed the suit as promised. I told him to have it ready in two weeks, and as an inducement I paid him the balance of the price. I did not wish to be indebted to him in case I did not return. Monday, July 5th, the departure of U-230 was scheduled for the evening. During the day we received an additional passenger. Because of the anticipated length of our voyage and the recent increase in injuries inflicted upon gunners and lookouts by aircraft gunfire, headquarters had added a doctor to our crew. He arrived at the pier laden down with several suitcases, as if he were embarking on a pleasure cruise. Hello, Herr Leutnant, he said. My name is Dr. Retcher. I will try to take good care of your men. But I must admit I have never been on a ship, much less a U-boat, would you please show me my cabin? Our boys, listening with broad grins on their faces, made some inappropriate remarks. I shook the doctor's slender hand and explained apologetically. Doctor, there is no such thing as a cabin aboard a U-boat. Also, we have no room for all that luggage. Please take only what you really need, about one quarter of what you have there, and follow me below. After he had reduced his baggage, I managed to accommodate him in the warrant officer's wardroom, assigning him the berth above the navigators. At sundown we attended our farewell party in the compound, then went to man the boat in small silent groups. Everyone, from the captain down to the lowliest seaman, said nothing of his thoughts about our imminent encounter with the deadly foe. It had become widely known, despite all efforts to keep it a secret, that the enemy was sinking three out of five of our boats as they made their runs through the Bay of Biscay.
On June 24th alone, the Tommies had sent four U-boats to the bottom within 16 hours. The night was stark and moonless when U-230 sailed. No band, no ceremony, no cheering crowd betrayed our clandestine departure to French partisans or English agents. These days, British intelligence had its eyes and ears on us everywhere, in the compound, in the shipyard, in the restaurants, and even in the etablissements. At the tip of Brittany, where the rocks of the coast sink into the ocean, we were picked up by a Coast Guard vessel which guided us south along the shore to a rendezvous with other U-boats from Lorient. The night passed without incident, and at dawn we joined U-506 and U-533. We three had been ordered to travel together through the Bay of Biscay, using our combined firepower to ward off British air attacks. As the boats converged, four escorts circled, the strange assembly on tense alert. The three U-boat captains carried on a shouted conversation through megaphones, discussing the strategy of the group march. They were to travel at the high speed of 18 knots on surface during the day, to stay submerged but in close contact all night, and to surface at dawn upon command. If an airplane was detected at a safe distance, the captain of U-533 would wave a yellow flag, indicating that all three boats should crash dive. But if he waved a red flag, the aircraft had already come too close for a safe dive, and all three boats were supposed to shoot it out. This plan, so cleverly conceived by our staff officers in the security of their office, was faulty in conception and nearly impossible to execute. For lack of anything better, however, the three captains agreed to try their luck. At 0810, the three boats turned their bows westward and began their attempt to break through the enemy's heavy defence. The escorts steamed east back into port as we hurried off. It was a humid and hot day, a good day to spend at the beach. Clouds were high, haze lingered low, the metox was quiet. Three strained hours passed without interference or contact. 11.35. The yellow flag went up on board U-533. The same instant we spotted the aircraft about 10,000 metres on starboard. All three boats ducked. 30 minutes later we heard U-506 sending the signal to surface on her newly acquired underwater sound device. Like trained seals, three U-boats broke surface simultaneously. They went to full speed and hammered westward, leaving three long foamy wakes. 1310. A liberator shot out of the cloud cover, distance 3,000 metres, too late to dive. The red flag went up at once, and on all decks the guns were manned. The big black bird dived down for attack. But before we had the range to open fire, the plane turned away and began to circle our group. 1318. A second liberator appeared in the sky a new variation on a familiar theme. Both aircraft kept circling at a respectful distance. I ordered more ammunition to the bridge and more stored in the conning tower. Diving at this point was out of question. Trapped by the planes, the three boats dampened the Tommy's eagerness to attack by sending bursts of gunfire toward them. The diesel's thundering noise filled the air, and from above came the low, throbbing roar of the aircraft's engines. 1325. A Sunderland dived through the clouds and joined the two liberators in their circling. Its appearance reduced even further our meagre chances for escape. 1332. With the arrival of a third liberator, the fourth aircraft, our chances sank to zero. Our patrol, only a few hours old, seemed to have come to a premature end. We waited for the assault with only a small spark left of the confidence with which we had sailed. 1340. A Liberator plunged into attack. The guns of three U-boats blazed at the pilot, who seemed insane to fly into our concentrated fire. But quickly a second Liberator fell upon us from the opposite side, forcing us to divide our firepower. All three boats began wild zigzag movements to spoil our attacker's aim. One of the planes, diving down on U-230 with flames spurting from its gun barrels, dropped its bombs and roared by missing our bridge by only three metres. Four explosions, four giant geysers. One man on our lower gun sagged and fell to the deck. Another replaced him. Moments later, four more fountains erupted around the tower of U-506 as the second plane cut through our firing line. We lowered the wounded gunner into the boat and heaved fresh ammunition to the bridge. 
Suddenly, U-506 dived. The four Tommies, seeing their chances, flew a combined attack. Then something unexpected happened. U-506 returned to the surface immediately, and some men jumped to the guns. The boat made a sharp turn to port, avoiding the bombs dropped by the Sunderland. The explosions boomed between the bellowing of our flak and the plane's stuttering guns and the roar of our diesels and the thunder of aircraft engines. The sea fumed from multiple exhausts and foamed from bomb bursts. The air shrieked with shrapnel and bullets ricocheting off our armour plating. Rising from its dive, the Sunderland caught a burst, shuddered and fell slowly into the sea. After the Sunderland had crashed, its comrades retreated. That was the moment we acted. With racing engines, the three U-boats ducked in an instant and dived. We were not quite down in safe depths when the tremor of detonating bombs told us that the British had not yet given up. That was the end of our plan to travel in a group through the flay of Biscay. Our contact with the two other boats was soon lost. Neither of the two reached port again. U-506 was sunk six days after the encounter, and U-533 was destroyed twelve weeks later, both victims of Allied air attacks. Dr. Raish, shaken by fear and seasickness, managed to treat our one casualty, who had been shot in the upper right thigh. Luckily, the bullet had passed without smashing any bones. Reishi bandaged the gunner with greatest difficulty, and when he had finished, he crawled into his bunk, himself badly in need of help. Day and night, the pursuers continued to bombard us savagely. We were hunted, persecuted, and almost driven insane. Dozens of times we crashed into the depths and the detonations reached after us, and yet day after day, for seven days in a row, we managed to escape. And when U-230 reached the rolling prairies of the mid-Atlantic, where we were relatively safe, we rose from the depths astounded by our survival. As usual, others had not shared our luck. During the same period, U-514 and U-232 were hacked to bits on July 8th, and U-435 was sunk one day later. On July 12th, the enemy scored two hits, destroying U-506 and U-409, and the next day, the British bombed U-607. All these boats were lost in the Bay of Biscay, perilously close to our route of march. Passing from the bay, out of range of the land-based bombers, we ducked only two or three times a day, gaining long hours on surface. The boat was cleaned of its mould and rot, the bilges scrubbed, and the refuse thrown overboard, a routine we had omitted in the bay. We also prepared our mines for the drop and our torpedoes for use when needed. Now on watch, we enjoyed bright days, and the blazing sun burned our skins deep brown. The crew began to show signs of appetite, and some machinists came up into the conning tower to puff a pipe or smoke a cigarette. The only one who never saw the sun, who never even rose from his berth, was our doctor. Reishi slowly dissolved on his mattress in seasickness. Yellow and thin, he rested quietly in his narrow bunk, accepted nothing, asked for nothing. It was only when we submerged for our regular trim dive, coming to rest for a while at sixty metres, that the doctor emerged from his leather bed, reminding us that he was still on board. U-230 proceeded steadily toward her destination. On most days, we reduced the distance to Chesapeake Bay by approximately 160 miles, depending upon the severity of the harassment from above. The stream of signals from boats in distress never ceased. Around that time, U-509 reported that she had been heavily damaged by aircraft and needed parts urgently, but nothing was heard from her again. The radio mate not only deciphered distress signals, he also typed and multigraphed the armed forces communiques he intercepted daily. We were startled by the news of swift Allied landings on Sicily and dismayed by word of continuing reverses in the Russian theatre. The world was aflame and the flames blazed highest where they were the least expected inside Germany. Our Luftwaffe, neglected by Göring and decimated by the Allies, could not prevent the Allied air flotillas from bombing our cities into ashes. Suddenly it struck me that the recent disasters of the U-boat force bore alarming resemblances to the defeat of the Luftwaffe in the air. But despite the burnings and bombings, the retreats and defeats, and the imminent danger of our own destruction, we kept our hopes high.
We had been told that the war would be won, and we still believed it, and still our U-boats continued to die. On July 20th, a radio signal told us that the logbook of one of our friends of Better Days in Brest was closed forever. The message aircraft attacked sinking imprisonment. U-558 was his last report. The following day we sighted a Catalina, a two-engined flying boat. We dived swiftly and stayed submerged for two hours, forcing its pilot to give up the chase. When we surfaced late in the afternoon, the sky was congested with heavy dark clouds. We took advantage of the storm front and raced at high speed into the evening. The night descended, but it was soon turned into day. Lightning flashed across the firmament. Dozens of bolts at a time stabbed perpendicularly down from the sky to the ocean, rose from the surface in agitated zigzags to pierce the clouds. Hour after hour, the lightning slashed forth and back, up and down, keeping the sky ablaze with the light of a billion torches, and the vast artillery of thunder burst and rolled and roared. The air reeked of phosphorus and made our eyes burn. After five full hours of lightning and thunder, the rains came. While the flashes kept lancing the clouds and the thunder echoed between sea and sky, torrents of rain beat the surface of the ocean flat. When the storm finally ended, a new day was born. It was clearer, brighter, more brilliant. It was the day we reached the continental shelf of North America. Expecting heavy U.S. air surveillance, we dived at 9.45 and put U-230 on course at a depth of 110 metres. During the long submergence that followed, we planned our tactics. The crew rested undisturbed in total silence. Later, the men were informed of the objective of our mission. At nightfall, we surfaced. It was 21.15, and Praga prepared to shoot several stars to determine our exact position. As he adjusted his sextant, I told him jokingly, Make sure you get a good fix, so we don't find ourselves caught in the locks of the Panama Canal. What would you say, exec, if I brought you into Lake Ontario? replied Praga. And we on watch had a good laugh that relieved our tension. Praga added, Don't laugh, boys, we're on perfect course. At 1.40 we spotted a shadow on starboard. It grew into a merchant ship. Her skipper had a guardian angel with him on the bridge. We wanted to avoid detection, not to sink ships. The balance of the night was uneventful, except for a false alarm about the time that Venus rose in all her brilliance. The air and surface proved to be empty. No aircraft or coast guard vessel came to disturb our stealthy approach. U-230 continued undetected at 18 knots, Cape Charles dead ahead. That night we received perplexing news. We heard on shortwave radio that a coup d'etat had taken place in Italy, that Mussolini had been arrested and Marshal Badoglio had succeeded him as head of government. If the broadcast had not come from a German radio station, we would have derided the report as an enemy lie. Even so, it seemed unlikely, though not particularly important. When the sun began to rise, we dived to maintain secrecy. Travelling westward slowly at a depth of 40 metres, we came within 30 miles of Cape Charles. Because we knew nothing of the US defences, we manned action stations and kept the aft tube ready to shoot in case of a surprise attack. Shortly after noon, the sound man reported increasing propeller noise. The chief raised the boat to periscope depth for the captain to investigate. To Siegmund's surprise, we were dead ahead of a small convoy, much closer than the gear indicated. There were four destroyers shepherding only seven cargo ships. Suddenly the captain cried, Boat is coming up, hold her down, bridge is breaking surface, down with her chief. Friedrich applied all emergency measures, no reaction. What the hell is wrong with this sloop? Dive, dive fast, hollered Siegmund. Valuable seconds passed as U-230 hung like a fish on a hook in full view of the escorts. Then, slowly, insanely slow, the boat drilled herself into a layer of heavy density water. Just as her stern moved into the specifically heavier stratum of water, a spread of six charges detonated in closest proximity. The explosions propelled the boat below the thermal shift, and her screws, turning in maximum revolutions, drove her downward until she touched the sandy bottom. The Asdic pings released by the US destroyers chirped through the shallow water, but did not hit our hull with the usual force. 
the sound waves were largely refracted by the dense layer of heavy water above us. For almost two hours, the hunters nervously screened the depths, vainly seeking something to attack. Then they departed without spending one more depth charge on us. We surfaced at nightfall. U-230 pushed swiftly and relentlessly ahead. Three hours passed in apprehension and mounting excitement. Then, port ahead, a vague glow crept over the horizon, the lights of Norfolk. Minutes later, Borchett shouted, America dead ahead! We had reached our destination. Time, 23.25. Date, July 27th, 1943. As the thin line of the coast emerged from the water, Praga's voice drifted up from the darkness of the control room. Boat is four miles east of Cape Charles. Suggest changing course to 235. Very well, acknowledged Siegmund. Exec, have the eggs ready for the drop. Right, sir, I said. Do you wish them served sunny side up? Everyone on the bridge laughed loudly. We were hilarious as we approached Fisherman's Island unmolested. One of the men imitated an Indian war cry, and we pictured ourselves as painted Indians attacking in a canoe. I ordered the four front tubes flooded and the doors opened. U-230 proceeded at high speed, leaving Fisherman's Island on starboard. Our depth finder sounded out the water. Praga took constant bearings. Our presence was still a secret. When we reached the halfway mark between Cape Charles in the north and Cape Henry in the south, Siegmund turned the bow of his boat into the shallow waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Surprisingly, not a single enemy vessel was there to stop us, as the lights of Norfolk became clearly visible on port. The American sailors must have been at a big party that night. They were surely not at sea. As we passed the naval base, the silhouette of the illuminated city rose sharply against the dark sky. Land rose all around us as we penetrated deeper into the bay. Two hours after midnight, we detected several cargo ships heading for the open sea. Their sudden appearance wrecked our plan to drop the mines that night. We had no time to dive and no alternative but to retreat into the darkness. For one long minute, our broadside was exposed unseen as U-230 made a full turn. Then we sped ahead of the vessels out of the bay. We saw one of them turn north and three veer south before they all dissolved in the night. We continued dashing eastward, covering 30 miles in two hours, then laid U-230 aground in shallow water and waited for the next evening to arrive. July 28th. At 21.45, when the last rays of the sun were extinguished, we surfaced and raced with highest revolutions back into Chesapeake Bay. Again we passed the line Cape Charles Cape Henry. To the left lay Norfolk, and the American Navy was again celebrating in port. The bay was deserted. Only U-230 made the sounds that disturbed the serenity of the night. It was near midnight when Borchert spotted a shadow suddenly mounting in the blackness dead ahead. We slowed down immediately, but the shadow grew so fast into a giant that Siegmund had to stop both engines to prevent our crashing into the stern of a merchant ship. Obviously, she was heading toward Baltimore. She sailed at a mere eight knots, rather slow for our timetable. But since we could not tell her skipper to hurry, we had to adjust our speed and follow in her wake. For several minutes, we used our powerful binoculars to survey the American countryside. July 29th. At 2.10, Siegmund reckoned we had proceeded far enough into the bay. Swinging his boat on opposite course, he headed back toward the flickering lights of Norfolk. As U-230 steadied on her course, I lowered myself into the darkened hull to activate and release the mines. Five minutes later, the first egg dropped from its tube with a soft splash. Three minutes later, egg number two followed, then number three, and the first tube was empty. As the mines were discharged in regular intervals, the tubes were speedily reloaded. Fresh mines were lifted from their racks by trolleys and chains and cautiously moved into place. The hot bow room steamed with the sweat of half-naked bodies and resounded with the clanking of chains. The drop went smoothly and lasted one hour and fifty minutes. After it was all over, I hurried to the bridge and reported, Twenty-four eggs dropped into Uncle Sam's front yard. Replied Siegmund, Since Easter is a long way off, let's not wait till the egg rolling starts. 
Both engines full ahead, steer course 9-0. The boat gained momentum fast and scurried along at 17 knots, past Norfolk, past Fisherman's Island, toward a new morning sky. We dived around six o'clock without any interference and floated into the open sea far below surface. That evening at 22.30, U-230 rose to the surface again. Siegmund chose a southwestward course and raced the engines high, leaving the scene of our secret gift far behind. The following day we were back in our old routine diving three or four times daily before aircraft. The exultation over our performance did not diminish our alertness. Since our METOX had not helped us much to detect enemy planes, we relied on our eyes as the guarantors of our survival. On July 30th, we received three consecutive distress signals, all giving the same position in the Bay of Biscay as the place of attack. Riedel, visibly shocked, handed me the messages. Attacked bombs, sinking at 46 N10W, U504 attacked by aircraft. Sinking 46 N10W, U461 aircraft. Bombs, sinking 46 N10W, U462. We realised these boats had used the same formation conceived so ingeniously by headquarters, but quickly abandoned by us. Knowing that they were large, unmanoeuvrable U-tankers, we could easily picture the uneven fight. Unable to respond quickly or to support one another, they had probably lost the fight before they stopped waving flags as the Phoenicians did 3,500 years before. Not only had three boats died, their destruction drastically reduced our chances of being refuelled at sea. The British air victory in the Bay of Biscay was matched by another one over land. For the third time, we heard on shortwave radio that Hamburg had been repeatedly bombed. The report said that the heaviest attack came during the previous night, when half of the city had gone up in flames. I saw Siegmann's face turn dead white at the news. He never touched his food that day. He stayed closed up in his nook behind the green curtain. We grieved for the captain. Every man aboard knew that his whole family lived in Hamburg, his wife, his children, and also his parents. When the flames in Hamburg finally subsided, 41,000 people had died and over 600,000 were left homeless. August 1st. Having put some 400 miles between us and the Chesapeake coast, we risked sending a report to Admiral U-Boats. Special mission completed. Request new orders. Low on fuel at 27 and 68 W. Three hours after our transmission, two four-engined aircraft fell suddenly out of the sky. We crash-dived in confusion. Depth charges exploded all around us. That day we dived four more times, and it was obvious that our radiogram had sparked a massive U.S. air hunt. After dark, we received orders to continue south through the Caribbean to waters east of the Windward Islands. There we would refuel from U-459, one of our U-tankers. Two hours later, Riedel deciphered a personal message from headquarters, U-230, Siegmann. Family safe, all well in the country, Dönitz. This signal did more for the captain and the crew than a decoration for the mining mission. We continued our march to the south with caution. The crash dives were routine, and so were the bombs. Then, on August 3rd, we received a message from headquarters, which had a greater impact upon our lives than any since the beginning of the Allied offensive. All U-boats, attention, all U-boats, shut off METOX at once. Enemy is capable of intercepting. Keep radio silence until further notice. This warning reached U-230 in time, but it came too late for some 100 boats that had been sunk before the discovery. We were suddenly aware that in our very effort to survive, we had used a device that revealed our position just as clearly as a lighted Christmas tree. For weeks and months, we had been sending out invitations to our own funeral. The knowledge was maddening, and it made our survival all the more incredible. We turned off the METOX with a sigh of relief and continued south. However, our hope of reaching port again diminished when we learned that our tanker had not answered headquarters' repeated calls. During those early days in August to 43, U-230 was shifted three times for refuelling. Each time the expected U-tanker failed to arrive at the rendezvous, and we were left stranded. Whatever caused the mysterious failures of the U-tankers, our situation grew steadily more perilous as the days passed and our fuel supply dwindled. 
On August 9th, our long, desperate wait was interrupted by a new tragedy, once again involving three of our boats. It began with a signal released from a boat that floated helpless some 400 miles east of Recife, Brazil, attacked by aircraft, damages, unable to dive. U-604. In an attempt to save the ship's company, headquarters ordered U-172 and U-185, which were in the vicinity of the stricken boat, to go to the rescue. There was radio silence for about 30 hours. Then on August 11th, a signal crossed the Atlantic, attacked by aircraft, damages, U-172, only minutes later, Liberator, attacked, sinking, U-604. In about an hour, we received a third message, rescued crew, U-604, downed aircraft, damages, U-185. Subsequent signals revealed that U-172 had also taken aboard survivors of U-604, and was hastily repaired with the help of U-185. Then the remaining boats began their 3,000-mile march to home port. U-185 never arrived. She was lost on August 24th, herself a victim of air attack. By August 13th, U-230 was floating along with only two tons of diesel oil. Our position? About 300 miles east of Barbados. That afternoon, we received a fourth date to meet with a newly appointed supply boat, U-117, in Grid Square DP-64. The rendezvous was set for August 17th. In an effort to be both saving and secretive, we submerged during the day, sailing at low speed to conserve our batteries. And at night, we travelled on surface at moderate speed, parting with every litre of fuel that went into the diesel engines, as if it were a drop of our own blood. Nevertheless, we arrived punctually in the designated area. We cruised slowly in a search pattern until we exhausted our fuel. Then, drifting helplessly, we sighted a black speck miles away. It came cautiously towards us. But instead of meeting with the tanker, we said hello to our old friend Dahlhaus of U-634, whose boat was also to refuel that day from U-117. U-117 never arrived. After almost two days of strained waiting, Dahlhaus and Siegmund decided that U-634, which had almost 15 tonnes of fuel, would dash 150 miles westward and then inform headquarters of our dilemma. Thus we would be safe even if Allied forces picked up the signal and converged on its source. U-634 left us. We lay there motionless for hours, a sitting duck for any passing enemy. After ten hours of suspense, we intercepted Dahlhaus's SOS signal to Admiral U-Boats, then we waited with even keener suspense for headquarters' answer. It came at dawn on August 20th, sparking new hope. U-634 to share fuel with U-230. Both proceed into DF-91, refuel from U-847 August 27th, return to base by shortest route. Dahlhaus finally returned after an absence of 46 hours. Rather than running the risk of refueling by daylight, both boats submerged and waited until the sun had curved across the sky. After dusk, we surfaced, received our share of fuel from U-634, and laid plans to meet Dahlhaus and the U-boat tanker again in five days. Then the two boats separated. The nights were calm on our march eastward. During the day, we travelled submerged until we had reached the centre of the Atlantic, where the air traffic ceased. During the night of August 27th, we entered the square of our new rendezvous and began scanning the surface for familiar silhouettes. But it was morning before we spotted three conning towers in the quiet sea. As we converged, the superstructure of the huge supply boat, U-847, emerged from the ocean, increasing our number to five. We waved to U-634, greeted U-415, and sent our compliments to U-172, the boat that had rescued half of the crew of U-604. Any assemblage of five U-boats was extremely dangerous, and we could only hope that the enemy had not learned of our meeting. U-634 and U-415 did not waste any time. They pulled alongside the supply boat and began sucking their allotment of fuel. Three hours later, Dahlhaus relinquished his hoses to us, and we began to draw aboard 15 tonnes of the precious liquid. 
Soon, U-415 had received her share and made way for U-172. As U-415 turned away, we wished her a safe return to Brest. I would have added a prayer if I had been prophetic, for I was to become the captain of U-415 seven months hence. Knowing that we were helpless while taking the heavy oil into our tanks, our boys manned the guns and stood ready to cut the hoses instantly. Not so the crew of the supply boat, they simply stood around the large superstructure like street corner idlers. In disgust, I yelled to the exec of U-847 through the megaphone, What's the matter with you people? Don't you have any respect for aircraft? We haven't seen any since we passed Greenland, he shouted back. You better change your attitude. Tell me, where do you fellows sail from here? To Japan, he replied nonchalantly. But after giving away 50 tonnes of fuel, I guess we'll only make it to Surabaha. Sceptically, I wished him good luck. Soon afterward, our hoses were disconnected and U-230 withdrew from the uneasy meeting. After a brief trim dive, we proceeded cautiously on surface and followed in the wake of our predecessors, on a straight line toward port. Two hours after our departure, the supply boat broke radio silence and reported that she had completed the refuelling of all four boats. By sending that message, U-847 not only jeopardised the four boats she had supplied, but also sealed her own fate. Within minutes, the British Direction Finding Service had pinpointed her position. Three hours later, she was attacked by US aircraft and sent to the bottom, a large iron coffin for every man aboard. That afternoon, I heard the reverberation of many bombs some 60 miles astern, and I knew that U-847 had died a needless death. Like the other three U-boats, U-230 did not have sufficient fuel for any elaborate evasive manoeuvres, and we were obliged to take a shortcut through the Azores. While clearing those islands on the afternoon of August 30th, we overheard a signal from Dahlhaus up ahead, convoy course north, hunted by Corvette, U-634. Only minutes after we had received his call, we heard a terrible depth charge barrage originating at Dahlhaus's approximate position. The pounding continued with increasing violence for over four hours. After that, U-634 did not report again. She had been sunk with all hands. After U-230 passed the 20th longitude west, air attacks increased. Now we were penetrating Death Valley. We decided to stay submerged throughout the night and to travel on surface. During the day, though only when the sky was clear, but the British ruled the sky and the Bay of Biscay trembled under their constant bombardments. We thrust through falling bombs and blazing gunfire and a boiling sea and managed to gain a few pitiful miles each day. The nights brought some relief, but not much. We slipped through cordons of corvettes and frigates, evaded their long-range ASDIC pings and their endless supply of depth charges. After seven cruel days, we finally saw the rocks of Brittany emerge from the sea. It was the 8th day of September, almost ten weeks after we had left port. We met the minesweeper outside the entrance to the harbour of Brest. That was the moment when the men below changed into fresh fatigues and struggled wearily onto the deck to smoke their first cigarettes in weeks. That was also the time when our doctor rose from his bunk and displayed his greyish, suffering face to those who had long since forgotten him. Siegmund stuck a big cigar into his full red Viking beard and puffed away contentedly. Sailing under our magic umbrella, we had once again defeated the enemy's best efforts to lay us on the ocean floor next to our dead comrades. As soon as U-230 had moored in one of the concrete berths, Friedrich came climbing down the bridge, a straw hat over his long hair, a black beard framing his pale face. He was carrying a porcelain cup in his hand. The chief saluted and presented the cup to Siegmund. I wish to impress on you, sir, that this is all I could squeeze out of the tanks. A few drops of fuel oil, no more. Siegmund grinned. You see, chief, that is how efficiently I operate lately. You have got to give me credit. I always provide a margin of safety. Our reception in Brest reflected the strained state of affairs and was overshadowed by the general dismay over our endless string of losses. The pier inside the large concrete bunker was dotted with a few men in navy blues, 
and two girls had found the time to greet us with flowers. The ceremonial meal at the compound was well prepared, but the mood of the feast fell far short of our former joviality. I soon retreated into my room and found my belongings neatly stacked on the floor. I withdrew my testament from the pigskin suitcase and tore it to pieces. So ended my longest patrol. Then came the ritual of reincarnation. I was reborn in a hot shower and fully grown by the time I was shaved and barbered. It was my intention to call on Vera. In my weeks at sea, I had plenty of time to make big plans for the evening, and even greater ones for the weeks to come. I was just remembering how to knot my tie when Fred Schreiber, my confederate in many a land battle, walked unsteadily into my room, carrying a half-empty bottle of champagne. Well, well, he said boisterously. I see someone is preparing himself for a comeback. How long were you at sea? Ten weeks, you say? May I make just one bet? Go ahead, Fred, what's on your mind? I bet that she has run away with another fellow in blues. You can't desert your girl for ten weeks and expect to find her waiting. Here, have a drink with us, who have swallowed our chagrin over the infidelity of our girls. I resisted the temptation to tell him that things were different in my case, that a girl was waiting for me right here in the compound. Fred continued, Why don't you join us this evening? We are going to have a great party in the photographer's atelier, with plenty of girls, champagne, a band and much more. Burke's girl is giving her birthday party and everybody is invited. Had I heard right? Fred, who is the girl giving the party? Oh la la, you won't have a chance. It's Vera, the photographer. She and Burke have been going hot and heavy. That was the end of my fine plans. I took a glass of Fred's champagne and used it to swallow my chagrin. I told Fred I had made other arrangements, and as he left, I lit a cigarette and tried to dismiss my disappointment. After all, I had no claim on Vera, and a pretty girl in port was the target of many men who had the luck to be available. Vera probably never expected me to return. A U-boat man's estimated lifespan on the front was but six or seven months no more. Instead of going to Vera's, Riedel, Friedrich and I celebrated our return with a gala dinner in the Sea Commandant, the restaurant that offered everything a hungry seaman could want. During the overhaul of our boat, Great improvements were supposed to be made aboard. U-230 was to be equipped with two two-barreled and one four-barreled anti-aircraft guns, a measure long awaited. The firepower of those eight barrels would undoubtedly make any pilot think twice before diving close to drop his bombs. A new radar receiver, known as the Bug, was to be installed, replacing the obsolete Metox. I was told that the Bug would register wavelengths in the centimetre range. If so, it should give us ample warning against sneak attacks, especially at night, for already our elimination of the Metox had forced the enemy to resort again to the detectable use of his radar. In addition, new torpedoes had been developed and were ready for use. These and other new weapons promised to change our luck in the U-boat war, and the time for a change was long overdue. Thirty-seven boats had been lost in July. Ten out of the seventeen boats that had tried to cross the Bay of Biscay in the latter part of that month never finished their dash. Then in August, sixteen more boats had been destroyed. In a four-month period, over one hundred U-boats had been sunk, almost sixty percent of the entire operative fleet. As a consequence, our destruction of Allied shipping had fallen from a high of nearly a million tonnes in March to a mere 96,000 tonnes in August. Many friends and familiar faces had vanished. The mess halls had many empty seats and little of the laughter of earlier days. We, who had so far been spared, had good reason to think that our faces might also be missing soon. Harbour routine swiftly replaced stress and strain. Our men kept busy, attending to their boat and to their girls with equal dedication. The captain departed for the obligatory report to Dönitz, and for a whirlwind tour through several classrooms to keep himself abreast of the rapid developments. Our doctor was released from U-boat duty and sent into the Austrian Alps to recuperate from his near-fatal adventure. Headquarters had finally abandoned the idea of staffing U-boats with physicians. Most of the submersible doctors had perished in vain with their boats, and medical skills were desperately needed elsewhere. The new torpedoes promised for the next patrol meant that I would have to take a brief course in Gottenhafen on the Baltic. I accepted the unexpected interlude with relief.
Before my departure, I found time to visit my tailor. He was surprised to see me again, for our calamities were no secret to the French. My suit was hanging on a rack. It was perfect. To complete my wardrobe, I purchased a gabardine coat, silk shirts, and smart, sporty shoes. It was the fourth year of war, but the French still could supply everything for the right price. I could afford to pay that price. There were no girls, no bars, no parties at sea. Five days after U-230 had returned from her mission, I was on an express to Paris, my civilian suit carefully folded in my pigskin suitcase. Upon my arrival, I returned to the hotel near Place de Vendôme and transformed myself into a civilian. It was the first time that I had put aside navy blues in four years. Now Paris lay at my feet. It pulsated with life, as I thought life should always be. My desire to bathe in an atmosphere of peace had grown steadily as the war dragged on. I wanted to join the fortunate ones who did not have to worry about tomorrows filled with roaring diesels and exploding depth charges and death in an iron coffin. I wished to forget that I was a cog in the war machine that had spread disaster far and wide. I wished to see life again not as a warrior but as an innocent bystander and to taste the feeling of complete independence from duty, if only for a day between trains. Only one place seemed to transmit the overwhelming sense of freedom and tranquility that I desired. Paris. Paris did not disappoint me. It was, as ever, enchanting. I felt the city's spell as people of many nations and eras had felt it. Free of the restrictions a uniform enjoins, I strolled contentedly through the streets and wide avenues, and I knew my disguise was a perfect one when I felt the furtive glances of those Parisian beauties who never condescended to look at a man in uniform. I was entirely divorced from the war for twelve pure hours, 